everyone. Welcome to the Romance Track here at Continual. I'm your host, Gail Z. Martin, and tonight we are talking about summer loving and all the heat that comes with it. But before we get into that, let's let our wonderful panelists introduce themselves, starting with Nancy. I'm Nancy Northcott. I write contemporary paranormal romance featuring mages and ghouls in southern Georgia. That's the state, not the one across the ocean. I also write historical fantasy for Falstaff books. And with Jeannie Adams, I write the Outcast Station science fiction series. Okay, Dawn. My name is Dawn Deal. I write contemporary and paranormal, sometimes historical romance. Uh, tends to be on the steamier side, I will tell you that. And I write for Ecstasy Books and Changeling Press. Very good, BJ. Hi, I'm BJ Allison. I'm from Nova Scotia, Canada. I write mostly contemporary small town romances, but I've also gone into the paranormal realm. I have an upcoming book sometime later this summer. And Kay. I'm Kevin Coles, and like BJ, I also write contemporary, but I tend to write about uh, urban city sort of settings. I have dabbled in paranormal. I just released a paranormal novel earlier this year, and I also have a, a book coming out later this summer. Okay. And I'm Gail C. Martin and Morgan Bryce. As Gail, I write epic and urban fantasy. As Morgan, I write urban fantasy, now male paranormal romance. So um, toss my hat in the ring there. Now, what is it about summer love affairs that just captures our imagination? I mean, whether you start humming that song from Greece or whatever it is, mm -hmm. under the boardwalk, toes in the sand, you know, there's just something about falling in love in the summer. What is it? And why do we, uh, why do we find that so attractive? And, and how does that play in, if it does, to any of your books, Dawn? Um, I think summer, there's something about the fleeting nature of it. In the, of course, everything's in bloom and everything's lush. And I think people respond to that. Um, so I, I, I love summer romance, right? Summer 11. Um, how does that play into mine? I have several that are set or at least begin in summer. Um, one of them is actually set on Midsummer's Eve. So, you know, using this idea of that. And of course you can be outside more, gives you the idea of the beach, um, gives you even the mountains and things like that. There's a, there's a I think it opens up um, a lot of possibilities for a writer because, and there's inherent romance and the sunset and the moonlight and nobody's, right? Most people aren't hanging out in January under a full moon, you know, so I, I think it's it's just a world of possibility that lets us play. Okay, I mean, not to mention that people generally wear fewer clothes in the summer. That, that, that <laughs> is an inducement to romance. Yep, this is true. BJ? I forgot the question. <laughs> What's so special about summer and romance? Oh, I'm sorry. That's um, okay. <laughs> Summer romance. Well, I'm with Dawn on that. Everything's lush and green, gorgeous. There's midsummer, you know, the, the uh, pagan festival happening in June, and there's harvests and times for all this love and everything else that's happening. And like you said, not as many clothes. So, you know, people are more, for some reason, people are just more apt to, to have fun so to speak, in the summer, so well, that's okay. my thoughts on it. How about you, Kay? Yeah, I would agree with all of that, but I also, I live in the Northeast United States, so our winters are not awesome. Lots of snow, it's usually very cold. There's a great bar culture where I live, which is wonderful if you like bars, but as soon as the summer begins, spring and summer, and we don't get much of a spring either, so as soon as summer happens, everybody's outside, there are a lot fewer clothes. <laughs> and um, I think too, that if you, if you have any children in your, in your stories, you know, the school vacation play can play a big part of that in your plots and things like that. It's just more traveling, I think, and, and being outside more. Yeah, I think also a lot of people take vacation in the summer, even if it's a long weekend uh, or if they can longer. And so they're more likely to be someplace they haven't been before. They're at one of those cozy bed and breakfasts or they're hiking somewhere. There's somewhere where they're going to meet someone that they don't run across every day in their normal lives. And so that gives you plenty more potential for romance 
because when you're hunkered down in the winter, you're seeing a lot fewer people. I mean, you know, right. unless the UPS delivery guy is cute, you might just be out of luck until spring. Nancy, how about you? Well, I agree with everything everybody has said. And I also think that people tend to relax more in the summer. It's warmer, um, fewer clothes, but also fewer worries if you're gonna be on holiday or with the movement of people, you're not, I think, picking up on what Gail said about not being with people you already know. You don't feel this urge, I think, to make such an impression on the people that you meet because odds are you're not gonna see them again. It's like that song, Beach Baby, um, the, about summer romance. And it's, it's a trope for a reason, you know? And I think people are just more relaxed and more open in the summer. And um, I actually did use the summer in two of my books. Um, in Renegade Mage, my paranormal romances, that takes place in the summer because it, the summer weather just was something I wanted to play with because the book's set down in Southern Georgia and it's, it's nice and warm and muggy in Southern Georgia. And so that kind of played into the, the choices the characters made and the circumstances that they dealt with. And then I also, which I forgot to say in my intro because I was trying to be concise, write romantic suspense. And one of those is a second chance at love home down, hometown romance that takes place in the summer because you can go and swim in the lake in the summer. And as BJ said, fewer clothes. And, you know, it just worked out really well for that story. Okay. And uh, Kendall's going to be joining us um, in a minute. So let's back up and uh, Kay and BJ, if, have you used summer in particular in some of your stories? We, we skipped that part. So come back and tell us about that while Kendall gets, uh, you know, plugged in. Sure. BJ, you want to go first? Okay, I can go first. Um, Under Your Scars came out a couple years ago. This is, uh, it starts out in uh, mid-July and goes right up till after Labor Day. Um, showcases Bridgewater, my hometown, and such, and my upcoming story, honestly, I don't know, you guys can't see that, <laughs> can you? No, uh, honestly, with just coming out in just under six weeks from Ecstasy Books, uh, that's actually set on the Bay of Funday, highest tides in the world, and uh, like starts in June and runs until the bulk of it runs until sometime in September. Um, it's also a small town romance set around Annapolis Royal, which is like very close to the highest tides of the world. So it's really cool. I'm so excited about this. It's coming out on my birthday. <laughs> so really tickled. Sounds fun. Sounds like a lot of fun. And that area is gorgeous. Um, I've been there and, and it is just absolutely beautiful. I can see falling in love up there. Oh yeah. <laughs> Hey, how about you? And then we'll come back and, and get Kindle all introduced. Sure. Um, I do have, I, I'm, I'm just thinking about all the books that I've set in the summertime. Like I said earlier, I live in a place that is not super hospitable during the winter months. So I think that when I'm writing, I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to go outside a whole lot more than I am. <laughs> um, I have a couple of books. One's called Open Hearts, and that is very much a summer story. Um, and then a couple of other ones, Third Time's the Charm, that's happening throughout the sort of spring into summer. Because I feel like there's that sense of renewal, you know, and you're learning new things, you're meeting new people. We've all talked about this already, but um, there are several books that I can think of. Those are the two that come up most okay. immediately. Kindle, welcome. Um, let's catch you up with letting you say who you are, what you write. And then the follow-up question was, what is it about summer romance that is so exciting and have you written um, summer romances? So I'm gonna drop all of that in your lap right there and <laughs> get you caught up. We can't hear you. Can you hear me there now? You. Yep. <laughs> it, this is a two button push microphone and I don't ever remember that. You can't just say one time that you want it to come on. You have to tell it twice that you want it to come on. Um, first off, I'm organizationally challenged, so I am situationally unaware, so I've been sitting here waiting for seven o'clock to come, and, you know, I'm not Eastern Standard Time. I'm Kendall Alexander. 
um, I write gay, gay romance. I don't remember exactly everything I was supposed to say, except summertime romance. Isn't that just such a romantic time? As long as you're not in the anus of hell, like living in Dallas, like me, and you actually can go outside in the summer, it's just such a romantic time. And hi, everyone. I love you all. Hi, I'm waving each picture. Hi. Okay, D did I cover all y'all? Did I say everything? Mostly. Have you okay. um, have you written summer romances? I have. I have written summer romances, but not exclusively summer. My tent. My books tend to be so long because I can't shut up that we always cover those summer months and those are truly the magical times in the book there's just everything good happens in the summer you know all of the beaches and all of the patio dinners and all of the dancing in the streets and just all of those things that I think happen in the summer because you know again anus of hell is where I live I have been to really Dallas. Are, yeah. It is very hot. It's very hot. It's very hot. It's a million degrees outside. And mm -hmm. the humidity is almost a million percent. So in my mind, that makes a billion degree. It feels like a billion degrees outside. I want to see, I want to see a summer romance where they really, really love each other, but they're so hot and sticky, nobody wants to touch. touch. So it's like, you know, <laughs> the smell. The smell is too much. They smell too bad. <laughs> And, yeah. and then the other side of it is, is you don't want to be touched when you're that hot, mm -hmm. you know, like don't touch me either. Get your hands off me. That's not very romantic. It takes a lot of air conditioning to overcome it takes, that. It does. It does. Now, what about, Nancy gave us a great segue into the next one, which is what are your favorite summer romance tropes? And uh, let's start with, uh, well, let's start with Kindle because I'm going around the I'm going around my little circle here. Don't start with me. I have to cough. Go on to the next person and let oh. me cough and then I'll be back. Okay. <laughs> BJ? Uh, favorite summer romance tropes. Oh, goodness. Beach. Definitely the beach, especially here in Nova Scotia. We have over 4,600 uh, miles of shoreline here, which is about close to 7,000 kilometers for anybody who's not familiar with what a, how long a mile is. Um, you know, we have a lot of beaches here. My favorite is Crescent Beach down at Petite Revere. I practically grew up down there in Rissers Beach, Green Bay. Um, there's Evangeline Beach up in the, uh, up on the Minus Basin, which close to Burnt Coat Head, which has the highest vertical tides in the world. I love bragging about that, being from Nova Scotia. But, you know, you got to have time at walks on the beach, romantic moonlight walks i love them i also love um summertime hikes you know just being outside having fun you know getting to know this this person this special person and just being outdoors enjoying each other like or just out by the pool reading or something like that i just love that kind of thing okay okay I had to unmute myself. Um, I was just writing down things because they were flying out of my head. I was, I do like beaches. Beaches are super romantic, but I, I am more of a shade kind of a person. So I prefer something like a cabin. I'll go camping. It's not my favorite thing because I'm kind of a city person, but I still like it. It's nice. And plus you're alone out in the woods. You could be naked out in the woods. Can I say that now? It's 10 minutes. In. Without the mosquitoes. Um, you gotta watch also... the mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> and ticks. Yes, and also antics and ticks, right? Yeah, up here too. <laughs> um, and then the other thing I was thinking is cafes, because then you can be outside. So that's nice. And you can get, get a lot of romance, I think, over food and wine and things like that. Absolutely. Well, two of my series are set in beach towns, one set in uh, Cape May, New Jersey, and one set in uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Two beach towns, same ocean, very different cultures. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of fun to have that beach um, location and factors into a lot of the sexy times and the romance with the characters. I've got another series that's set in the Adirondacks uh, where you've got lakes instead of beaches, uh, cold lakes, cold lakes even in the middle of summer, but refreshing. 
and lots of woods and cabin and bears and <laughs> mooses and things like that. So, um, but great for walking on trails and taking a dip, a refreshing dip in the water and um, seeing a beautiful sunset over a lake. So yeah, the, the idea of getting away and trope wise, uh, you know, it's great for forced proximity. If you've got two people stuck in a cabin or two people stuck in an RV, um, and I, you know, so yeah, all of those things are favorites for me. Nancy. Well, of course I love beaches and I love beach romances. And when I wrote Worth the Wait, which is the small town romantic suspense that's not paranormal, I wanted to use a town in Eastern North Carolina with an easy driving of Raleigh for st various story reasons, but I also wanted a beach. So I gave the hero a pond in his backyard where his parents had hauled in sand and kind of made their own beach. So we had a little beach cookout event in there. And the other thing that's fun about holidays is they're more community type events. Fourth of July, obviously, but frequently Memorial Day, um, some, somebody might put up a gathering for the solstice or for midsummer. And those are all things where people who are visiting could, can run into each other. Not that I've actually done that, mind you, but that is a thing that people do. And I enjoy reading those stories. And um, I just like the feeling that we're just freer in the summer for whatever reason. And maybe that's delusional, but it's kind of a feeling that I have and that I give my character. So, you know, if we're delusional, we're all delusional together. Okay, Dawn. Um, so yeah, put me in the beach camp. I'm currently on the Outer Banks. So <laughs> loving the beach, but I think with it, whether it's the beach or the mountains, or actually I was realizing three of the four that I have that are set in summer aren't even in America. Like they're in Ireland, which is about as unsummary as usually you, you can imagine. It's this idea that you can be someone else. I love that trope. The, the, you are, you know, either escaping your boring life or you just want to be someone different. I think that summer and vacation and escape gives you that opportunity. Um, I think that a lot of summer, whether beach or wherever, it gives you some really um, neat possibilities for meat cutes or really meat uglies, like the, the sweaty thing. Um, and so, you know, I like, I like that trope. Um, there's almost a magic to summer. You know, and, and I think um, that several of us write paranormal and you said it in summer because there's a sort of inherent magic. Um, but there's also this intensity factor. So not just proximity, but intensity. I'm only here for one week. I'm only here for two weeks. And so I think that in some ways that can be freeing where things will move much faster because you don't have that much time. And I, I like that trope as well. It's okay. Back to you, Kendall. Can you hear me with only one button push? Yep. <gasps> okay, I don't know the magic you just did. Um, you know, I was listening to all your answers and I agree with everything that you just said. The beach is, you know, always a magical place. I have a book where um, two guys met at a street party outside you know, and the margaritas were flowing and, you know, it's just a whole thing, patio food, always lots of food in, in the summer outside. So you get all your fruits and vegetables and just all those kinds of foods, you know, that are so good. But, you know, I also think, I just want to add that pride is in the summer and mm -hmm. Those are parades and street parties and the seeing the other one across the street and then trying to find them in the crowd. You know, those that's kind of in my heart. Those pride events are in my heart because that is some fun times and some fun writing. So that's my answer. Okay. Now, everybody's got their favorites, whether it is hurt comfort or... Uh, friends to lovers or enemies to lovers or second chance at love or all of those what are your favorite tropes and does summer does a story set in the summer change those at all okay I love all of those tropes I'm sort of I have problems mm -hmm. with tropes I'll tell you right now but I was mm -hmm. just thinking that one that is really fun when we were all talking about sort of tropes in general um, summertime a lot of people have weddings in the summer 
and there's a lot of sort of romance happening there, especially if like there's a secret boyfriend or secret girlfriend kind of thing happening amongst the wedding party. So I do think that that summer settings can definitely affect some of those tropes because of all the things we've talked about. There's some intensity involved. There's frequently, you know, a time limit on how long this is going to happen. We're going to plan this wedding. We're going to fool around the whole time the wedding is happening. And then when it's over, we'll go back to our normal lives, which never happens. So I do think that there's a, that the summertime thing can really change the tropes that you're, that you're writing about. Does that answer your question? Oh, it absolutely does. I know one of my favorite um, tropes is hurt comfort. I just love to, you know, beat up one or both of the characters and then have them confess their deepest feelings, you know, as they're patching each other up or rescuing each other or saving each other or saving themselves, that, that just turns my crank. Um, but I also really love the, the friends to lovers. And, and like you said, you know, it's so easy to meet some new people and kind of hit it off with them over the summer and, and then have that turn into something. I also love fake boyfriend. Uh, where maybe somebody goes to one of those weddings with a fake boyfriend so that they don't end up going alone and, and it turns into something more because it always turns into something more. Um, or you run into somebody that you knew in the past or maybe you said hit it off, right. but what if it's an enemies to lovers kind of thing? You can't stand right. this person and you have to be around them for weeks and oh no, we're going to fall in love. <laughs> or people go on vacations and, and maybe break up right before they go on vacation. So they, they grab somebody to go with them because it's already paid for. And then, you know, hijinks ensue. So yeah, I, I love all of those tropes. Um, Nancy? Well, I love to read pretty much any trope, but I've noticed that my books tend to gravitate toward second chance at love, even if, and sometimes that's a permutation of friends to lovers because friends who had a moment and then walked away from it before and now here they are again. A um, couple of enemies to lovers and looking at what's out there, I think those are the ones I use the most, but I have a real fondness for reading friends to lovers because it's such a risk. You have more on the line, I think, when you're looking at taking a treasured friendship to the next step and what you're going to lose if it doesn't work out is a lot more than if it doesn't work out with the cute person you met in the pizza joint down the street while you were waiting for your order. Um, so I think that's probably one of my favorite ones to read because I love the way people really handle that. Um, but I like all the ones you mentioned. If it's a romance, pretty much I'm going to read it. Okay. Dawn? Um, I am a big fan of Fated Mates. Um, when, you know, that, that idea, whether it's like big fate or small fate, you know, whether it's sort of a friends to lovers kind of idea. Um, and I, I guess it's a trope. I'm a huge fan of nerd to hero. I love the geeky heroes, love them. And when they get their moment um, in the sun, you know, that I'm not really an alpha male, either writer or reader. And so I like this, this growth, that trajectory, um, both in reading and writing. I think those, might, I love them all, right? I'm like, Nancy, I'll read just about anything you put in front of me, but those are my favorites. Okay, Kindle. It worked again with you. You have to be on every call and everything I do from this point forward. All right. Again, I've listened to everybody and I agree with what everybody said, but one of, and I don't know how trope this falls, but one of the things that I love about summer is that you have a lack of clothing. So that instant sizzle, is that a trope where you just, you, you see somebody and you're just like, taken with them it's so much easier to write without being creepy or going too sexual when you know the guy's not wearing a shirt or he doesn't have a scarf and parka wrapped around his body and head you know and I tend to like those that where you're you're just caught in a snare not necessarily insta love but just that moment of you interest me when he has doesn't have a shirt on I like that whatever that can, whatever that is that's what I like I think it's a trope now we're, we're it, I'm voting that's a trope okay good me too that's two of us yeah. yeah. instant sizzle that's why y'all are my Instant's. friends love it <laughs> when, when our daughter who was raised in the south went to college in uh the middle of Pennsylvania in the mountains she despaired that 
wearing all those down parkas and scarves and hats that that any guy would ever notice because she was basically this large Stay Puft marshmallow. Right, all the time. <laughs> I, I, I assured her that a polar bears can see the inner sexy polar bear <laughs> and northern guys have x-ray vision for down jackets and, and this is how the population continues and lo and behold she did meet a nice northern guy who could see through parkas so it well, works there's it also happened. the trope of um uh fall in love with the stay puff marshmallow it's, isn't that a trope i think that's a trope okay. it's Canadian, yeah i say it is yeah <laughs> yeah that's good. That works for me because that's my body type. <laughs> VJ, how about you? Oh, my favorite trope. I love, love, love second chance ones. Love it. My first book was a second chance, but I also love friends to lovers. I love the insta sizzle, as Kindle had said. Um, and the less clothing, able to look around and smile and whatever. In fact, my uh, upcoming book, honestly. <laughs> has um, a scene where he's visiting her at the summer house and she had been outside sun tanning and she's only wearing a skimpy bikini and her cousin kind of played a prank on her by tossing her cover up and her towel into the pool so <laughs> he gets a good the the hero gets a really good look at her head to toe <laughs> and um the sizzle starts there and keeps going and Oh, love, love, love it. Um, I'm also one for em enemies to lovers too, but it can't be too mean. Now, sometimes it, it is, some of the books I've seen have gone to the extreme where they're very mean to each other. I don't like that. I like like the um, the blogger heads where they're always like snarking, but it's not mean snarking. It's like, oh, you're such a dingbat and throws a pair of socks or something at them or something yeah that that's basically what it is so. yeah if they're too mean i can't figure out why they'd want to be together exactly. I, right. yeah. I feel to that way too without being real enemies mm -hmm. at least yeah i don't want to i don't want anyone to be like emotionally damaged you know what i mean i'm just exactly. like why would you like this person they're mean to you <laughs> yeah exactly. yeah now, part of what also um, several, what several people mentioned and what also kind of goes into the summer is foods. And I've got an editor personally that if I ever try to weasel out of it and go, they had dinner. She goes, what did they eat? What did they drink? How was it prepared? You know, I, so now I just have to list off all the foods and describe it because otherwise I'm going to get notes when I get it back. So what foods do you particularly love to write into your books or maybe regional cuisine or certain preparations you get in the summer you don't get the rest of the year that make it special for summer? Nancy? Well, I have a personal fondness for watermelon. And when you were bringing this up, it took me back to sitting with a row of my friends on a step with just the, the slice of watermelon it's about this thick and it's round at the bottom and you're having a contest spitting the seeds which you really can't do with the gen genetically modified watermelon. Those seeds are limp, they don't spit. I mean, yes, I have in fact tried it, but it's just, I think that could be a lot of fun in a book and watermelon is so dripping, you know? Oh, you're dripping, let me just get that for you kind of thing. And so it's, it's a way to touch. And then peaches, if you pick up a peach, a good peach and bite into it, it drips all down here. I mean, that's just cause it's a peach or a plum. So for me, it's mostly fruit. Um, and of course, ice cream. Ice cream is always popular in the summer and outside it's melting and that's something you can talk about. So I'll go with fruit and ice cream. Okay, Dawn. Um, well, what, wherever I'm writing about, I tend to mine the culture. But for summer, for me, um, it actually is more about the, the drink. That, that alcohol, um, because I, I tend to use it as sort of like a conduit for magic, you know, as that spark that, um, and so, yeah, give me whiskey, give me frozen drinks, give me, you know, little umbrellas, and, um, you know, I, I love to make stuff up, you know, make up drinks that are, aren't even physically possible because this is my world and, and I want a one that looks like it has stars in it or, or whatever. And so summer is the perfect time for, for that. And that's 
that's what I do. I do the, I'm the alcohol girl. So. Okay. Kendall. Um, I again, agree with what everyone said. I think for, for me, food is such a large part of all the books, but it is, like you said, very seasonally done, but also personality done. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you have a vegan, then you have to stay with the vegan foods, but if it's summer, then you're grilling. I don't know, squash. I, I don't know, whatever it is you're grilling outside because you know, I'm not vegan. I, I like cake. Um, but I have found that in doing my re research, that's a large part of my research is going in and finding out what summer foods people eat in what areas, because like in Ohio, their season is better. Their seasoning is better. You know, they don't use a lot of the jalapenos and all of those things that we use down here. And so that's very interesting to me too. But I think food is also a very great way to describe where you're at and what you're doing it tells a story without having to tell the story mm -hmm. so that's my answer but I love food and not only do I love food I have I'm trademarking something that we've written in our book for years about food because that's how much I find it important to the story for the storytelling okay interesting BJ Oh, food. I'm telling you, I focus on a lot of the Nova Scotian fare here, like the shellfish, the seafood, donairs. That is, um, it's derived from a gyro, believe it or not, um, and tailored to fit the uh, Canadian taste. Um, it was developed in Halifax back in the 70s. It's one of my favorite foods. So good. Um, it's uh, Halifax's regional food, believe it or not, the Donair is. We also have something called Moon Mist Ice Cream here, which is grape, banana, and I can't remember the third one, but it all, bubble gum. You mix it all together and it just, oh, so good. So it's different, but it's good. But in um, my upcoming book, honestly, um, he eats Acadian fare because he's Acadian and it happens on the Acadian shore of the Bay of Fundy up around like the Annapolis Royal Digby, those areas are all the Acadian shore of Nova Scotia. And um, he even speaks French. So he's there talking to her and eating the tortier, which is a type of meat pie. And he has pickled beets on the side. There's, uh, I mentioned uh, lobster rolls. There's, oh goodness, a lot of different really good regional foods mentioned in that book. And uh, in Under Your Scars, it's mentioned that she has halibut, which is also quite common here, uh, fried clams, that kind of thing. And I even feature, um, I don't say the name of the winery, but there's a winery in my home village of Crousetown that produces amazing wines from what I heard. I made it so that they had a dealcoholized version of Chardonnay and everything, so that way it all ties in together and I'm just show I just like to showcase how wonderful the culture and deep and rich it is here we were one of the first four provinces of Canada and I'm not afraid to brag that up very nice okay, uh, okay. I agree with all of what you said everybody um but I was just thinking actually about something that Kindle said about doing lots of research based on your character's sort of dietary needs. I, I don't know why, but I've gotten into the habit of sort of exploring not how I eat, but the way other people eat through characters. And I do a lot of research about that. Like I wrote a character who had a dairy allergy and then I had to figure out how to feed this person all the way through the story. But it was really an interesting way to go about the research. Um, so that's kind of fun. And also the thing I was thinking too is, um, so I come from a sports town. Baseball is a really big thing where I'm from. So that's another way to get people outside, get people together. But then there's this whole culture of food around sporting events that I think is really fun. Um, you know, as long as you like things. That's like really fun. And, that's uh, really, yeah. really fun. Yeah. There's a lot of 
social sort of activity happening there. I think a lot of it is related to, I was saying earlier that there's a very strong bar culture where I live because it's cold. So everybody goes to bars and hangs out. When it's warm enough to go outside, let's go to a game and hang out and, and drink and eat, you know, and just have a good time socializing, more drinking. But those are ways you can, the ways I certainly bring food into my writing. Oh yeah, I mean, with my two beach town series, a lot of seafood. Uh, a lot of grilling outdoors, um, a lot of barbecue because this is North Carolina. And so you, you get all of those things. But it, it's also fun to bring in some other things in the Cape May series, the, the Treasure Trail series. One of the um, important couples who weren't the main characters, but they're recurring secondary characters, uh, Jackson and Arjun. Arjun brings his uh, Indian heritage with him and he loves to cook. And so when he invites people over for dinner, he just cooks like, like he's having an entire family reunion coming over. And he's got a little bit of everything and, and everybody gets home in a food coma. Um, but we get to explore some of those things. And um, so I, I love bringing that in when characters bring a potluck or, or invite somebody over. And now you get to see a little more about maybe just a side character we get a lot more insight into, you know, well, this was my grandmother's recipe, so I always have to make it for holidays. Um, I think that that puts roots in the world, like it, it makes it much more three-dimensional and much more real. Um, so I, I love doing that. And um, of course, you know, you have to know what each of your character's favorite drinks are so that they can, you know, you're consistent with that. Now, oh, go can ahead. I, can I can I ask a question? Because sure. I think Kay brought this up. Um, no, BJ brought it up, I think. I always list restaurants that I find that I love. And every book that I write, I've gone to that restaurant and I've thought about how the character would act there and then how the opposite character would act there. If he's not social, if he's not that kind of eater, what would what would he see? Do y'all write the real names of the restaurants that you go to? Nope. No, I'm always afraid they're going to go out of business or move or just not want to be mentioned in that context, but I make something Dang. up. And if you know the area, then you'll know the restaurant. It, it's exactly. like, oh, I see what you did there. Yeah, that's really supposed to be X, Y, Z. I because what, what if I want to kill somebody in the restaurant? The restaurant wouldn't appreciate it. <laughs> like, I have to make up a name. But you know, when we did the Canaan Castle anthologies, mm -hmm. um, one of the people who contributes to those anthologies lives in Cambridge, the one across the Atlantic. And she stumbled across this lovely little tea room called the U, as in female sheep, U and Ply. And she got permission from them for us to put one of those in Canaan upon Ledwich, our town. So that's kind of a fun little thing. But of course, we can't like go splattering blood all over it or, or do anything that might make people hesitant to go. Or have the owners arrested for being actually, you know, yeah. dark witches or, or trolls in disguise. I mean, it puts limits on it. Just saying. Yeah. It would be bad. And one series that I read is Contemporary Romances by Kristen Ashley. And they're set in Denver. And she does use real restaurants because I was curious because we have family in Denver. And so I went to my friend, the Google, and there were these restaurants with menus and everything. So um, I've told my husband that at some point we have to try at least one of these restaurants because I've read all these books that they're in. And so I would like to have gone at least once so I can kind of get a feel for the taste of it or something. But most people I know don't use real names either. Yeah, I, I have think a really good a, time making them all. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I, I think there's a, a risk. My um, my mom mm. was reading a, a rather famous romance author, and we had to go to this town in Ireland. We had to go to this bar, and I had read the book. And we go to the bar, and I'm like, oh my god, this is such a dive. This is not what she described at all, even though she had used the name. I was very disappointed, and so I think there's sort of a, a risk on that end too that. Yeah, this isn't what, you know, what we thought. So, so oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. My upcoming book, I even concocted. Uh, no, actually, in Under Your Scars and the one that's coming uh, out later this summer, I even, like, created uh, two different cafes just so no one would get insult <laughs> insulted and stuff. And I, like, 
fictional names and everything. So, but I do mention the Don Roman Camper, and I, sh I don't think I should have now. <laughs> it's okay. It's so, um, small town, big city, or road trip? Don? Oh, I'm, I'm the road trip. Um, I really like, I like to travel anyway, um, but I, I think it, it gets you out of your box, you know, whether that box is your house or your apartment or whatever, um, all about the road trip. And there's so many possibilities, both good and, and bad, you know, um, well, storm at sea, you know, I, I think, I think among the five of us, we've done them all, I'm sure, you know, car breaking down, rescue, can, the hero can come rescue. I mean, there's all kinds of really great things. So I like to go other places and uh, I'm from Delaware and it's kind of boring. So, you know, I'm, I'm the road trip person. Okay, Kindle. Um, not small town because it's, that's not fiction to me or romance because that's where I live, but I do enjoy reading it in other books. I, I generally like destination, like you get in a plane and have to go there kind of thing. Um, or that you keep it in your area, in your downtown, but I generally like to fly by plane, I think. Was that it? Was that an option? Did you give that as an option? We'll count that as right. I think that, okay. Yeah. And I think like, you know, lots of Hawaii and lots of beach and South, not South Florida, North Florida area, you know, just lots of that kind of scene, I think. I think that's okay. my answer. But I'm not going to, I'm going to change that after I listen to all of y'all. <laughs> okay. DJ. Uh, for me, I generally stick. Well, small town romance author, what can I tell you? That's, I grew up in a small town. Bridgewater has like less than, than 10,000 people in it, but it's about 12 to 15 with the surrounding areas in Lunenburg County where I'm from. But I've also written books set in Halifax, which is our provincial capital and largest city. Um, but I, I prefer like the more exotic locations in my province like the Fundy Shore, I am in absolute love with Annapolis Royal, hence why I decided to set a book there. Actually, I'm going to be setting the next part of the next two books there, as well as this one. So that's just how much I love that town. But I also like the hustle and bustle of the big city. You know, Halifax, like I said, it's a lot, it's a bit of a culture shock going from this tiny little town where I'm in or this little village where I reside to this big huge town I mean I go in Halifax it's just like okay <laughs> you can tell I'm not used to a lot of traffic or anything because it's just um it's overwhelming for me but for someone else like in my characters it's not um but I've been all over Nova Scotia and I'm hoping you know to eventually set more um, more romances in different parts of the province. I'm a home buddy myself. I don't like traveling. I just, I don't know. <laughs> well, remember your hometown is, you know, a distant destination to somebody else. So, exactly. you know, it might be exotic to somebody else, uh, even though it's very normal to you. Okay. Exactly. I tend to write about city people because I live in one and I, I actually really like cities, but they tend to also, there's at some point um, like a, 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 sl a small road trip to someplace that's private so you can have some private time. Because I like that. I like being able to live in a city, but, but not have to travel terribly far to get a little privacy, whether that's, you know, a beach um, cottage or a cabin in, in the woods, something like that can just be really refreshing. Okay. Several of my series have former uh, big city people who are now living in a smaller place for reasons. And a couple of them have road trips built into it uh, in that they travel to, to do what they do. So I kind of like to mix it up and have the best of both, but I probably hit more small towns than cities for main settings. Nancy? Well, I grew up in a small town too. And I think the upside to a small town is people know if, you, if you're if you in trouble and they'll reach out to help you. 
The downside to a small town, which is a corollary to the upside, is everybody knows your business. And sometimes you don't want everybody knowing your business. But I use a small town in my Light Mage Wars series because it's a nature-based magic system. And so a small town works really well for that. But um, I have a series that I'm developing that most of it takes place in London and large cities in the United Kingdom. So I really like cities too, because there is an energy and there is a vibe and there's, it's a more welcoming um, setting for an encounter with a stranger. In a small town, a stranger sticks out like a sore thumb. In the city, this person could have been going back and forth a block away from you for years. And then you end up in the coffee shop together and you have a meet cute or however you want to do it. And we're off to the races. So I like to read everything. At the moment, I'm mostly using small town. And then um, road trip, the Canem Castle books are all road trip. So I guess that makes them destination romances. And that's a lot of fun. Um, I don't actually have one of those set in the summer, but we are looking at next summer. So maybe. Well, folks, we have blown through our time. So this is going to be a lightning round to go around, let everybody know where to find you. And if you have a new recent or upcoming book, uh, tell us about it briefly. Okay. I wasn't ready. KEvanColes.com is my um, website. I'm on most of the social media kind of things, Facebook, Twitter, BookBub. I do have a book coming out this summer. Call, I haven't figured out the name yet. I'm going to do that soon, but it's basically a, an age gap kind of a romance with a second act, second chance romance kind of thing. Cool. Uh, BJ? Um, you can find me at bjallison.com. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I just started TikTok, although there's nothing on the account yet. Um, goodness gracious. Uh, I have my own group, BJ's VIP Lounge. I hold takeovers and stuff like that and let other people do promos in there. Um, I have a book coming out on August 19th called Honestly, it's Feather Tartan Book 3, and it's the, about a trans man who falls in love with a Sika woman from Alberta, and she has to choose between him and her wealthy family, so that one's really good. It's set on the Funday Shore in the middle of, uh, starts in June and ends around Labor Day, so that's fun, and I'm just trying to think where else I am. <laughs> I am on social media and I can't think of anything else. I'm sorry. That's fine. Kendall? Okay. Well, I have a book out today. Congrats. Yay. <laughs> it's called Level Up and it is the second in, um, it's the second to break away, but that's another one of my books. And I also have a book named Secret and Secret was years ago, but there was a child in that book named Chad Reeves and he has moved forward into level up again out today. Congrats. Do we just again? Awesome. My, com my computer's going nuts trying to remind me to get on the Zoom call because I had it scheduled for seven. So did y'all hear that? Do I need to say it again? I'm just kidding. Yeah, we heard you. That's fine. Um and also social media everywhere. And I love all you guys and Kay Evan Coles we're supposed to be sharing information. Why don't we do that? Yes, ma'am. I I'm, know. Every time I see you, I'm like, why don't we talk more often? To do why don't we talk more often? Yeah. And I, but I love meeting <laughs> all of you. I love you guys. It's nice to meet you all. Nice to and meet we're you. happy you're here too. Dawn. So um, I can be found at DS Steel and it looks like to hell. It's D A T L um, dot com. And there are all my links to social media and links to my books. Or I can be found on Amazon, all the major retailers. Um, I don't have anything new coming out soon, but um, my Irish God series, my four book series, three of which are, are set in summer, is being bundled. And you'll be able to get that from X to C. I don't have a release date, but I would imagine it's sometime in the next three to four weeks. So it's a good deal if you're looking for some sand in your toes, escapist kind of magical reading. Sizzling summer savings at Access C some wine are on sale too. So yeah. nice. Nancy. Well, my most recent release is the Deadly Orb, which is number three in the Light Mage Wars book. But I don't have the print edition out yet, so I don't have one I can wave around. So I will wave around the second book instead. And this is Renegade Mage and is set in the summer. 
And uh, the fourth book, by the time this, this uh, panel posts, the fourth book, Embattled Mage, will be out. And those are paranormal romances about mages and ghouls. My website is nancynorthcott.com. I'm on BookBub as Nancy Northcott. I have a Facebook author page. I mostly tend to forget that I have because I don't really understand it since Facebook changed everything on the author pages. But I'm on Twitter more than is probably good for me. And I'm at Nancy Northcott and I do communicate there a lot. Okay. I'm pretty easy to find at galesymartin.com, morganbrice.com, all the social media. And I'm on almost all the platforms is some variation of those names. Spell them right and you'll find me. And uh, I do have a new book out. It's again, uh, Fox Hollow Zodiac book two. It's set in the Adirondacks in the small fictional town of Fox Hollow. And it's got a wolf shifter and a Canadian lynx shifter and lots of suspense and intrigue. Uh, but most of the time you can find me here on Continual. So thank you so much to all of you for being here and being wonderful panelists. And thanks to all of you for watching and listening. There'll be more Continual coming up soon and more romance on Continual. So we'll see you online. <laughs>